hello, hello. Welcome to our weekly webinar here at Rock Consultant. My name is Jesse Smith. I'm the Director of Operations Training here at Rock Consultant. I've got coming up now on about 20 years of experience in the space and all the blood, sweat, and tears that I've poured into this industry in that time. I'm now helping our brokerage and consulting teams here at Rock Consultant uh, bring the best and latest information and educational content to you all out there. So thank you so much for being here with us today as we roll into this Labor Day weekend. Hope you guys are staying safe out there. We got the, the hurricane rolling through and uh, our guest today is actually might be able to tell us a little bit more about that. But uh, again, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm going to read a quick disclaimer and get the most boring part of the way uh, of the day out of the way early. So let's go ahead and do that. Route Consultant is not endorsed by and is not recommended by Federal Express Corporation, FedEx Ground or Amazon. Rock Consultant is not sponsored by, is not approved by, is not associated with, and has no connection whatsoever with Federal Express Corporation, FedEx Ground, or Amazon. Now, I, would, I do want to say really quickly before we get into our content that if you have a question for us, you can ask that at any time. Go ahead and just make sure you use the Q&A feature. Don't use the chat feature. We reserve that for announcements and links and things like that. So if you do have a question, you can ask it whether it has to do with the topic at hand today or with anything related to the FedEx ground space. I will answer it if I'm able to. Our guest will answer. He has a ton of expertise in this space as well. Go ahead and put those questions in. And again, we'll get to them at the end, but you can answer them at any time. Just make sure to use that Q&A feature. So as I said, we do have a special guest for you today who I'm going to bring on in a second. But really what we're going to talk about as we get towards the end of August and into the cooler, thankfully, uh, you know, we get to the fall months and into, into winter time, we're coming up on peak season. And there is so much that goes into a successful peak season, especially on the P&D side. And if you're a prospective contractor, we're going to teach you all about the things that you need to know in terms of getting ready, scaling up. What does the CapEx look like as you get closer to peak? What's the timeline? How many resources should you have in play and ready to go in September, October, et cetera? We're going to talk about all that today. If you're on the line haul side, there's less to think about, but there's still maybe some tips and tricks that you can learn from us here uh, if you're interested in line haul. So I'll get to the listings, the active listings that we have later on, but we're going to go ahead and get to our content. So I'm going to bring on a, a guest we've had on a couple of times before. He's one of our favorites that we have on here. Marlon Campbell, if you want to go ahead and come on camera and on mic, uh, so glad you're here with us today, man. So why don't you give us a quick thumbnail of who you are, your experience in the space, and then we'll kind of launch into our content today. Okay. Thanks, uh, Jesse. Um, so my name is Marlon Campbell. Obviously, I've been a FedEx contractor now going on uh, approximately about three years. Um, I actually purchased uh, my first seven routes, actually, with uh, Spencer and Route Consultant, um, you know, back in 2020. Uh, when I came out of uh, law enforcement, you know, my career started uh, 13 years in the U.S. military directly as a deputy sheriff in law enforcement, uh, zero experience in logistics or anything. But I mean, you know, th this is a type of field. If, uh, you know, you put your mind to it, it it's not hard to adapt. It's not hard to learn. Um, you know, I went in, you know, knowing that I was going to be at the terminal every day and and kind of grasp all that knowledge. You know, I kind of took that in off the uh, the prior contractor that I bought from. Uh, he had about 15 years of experience. Um, the DRO stuff was kind of kind of new, but you know, I kind of grasped the technology part a little, little pretty good. And I was able to kind of adapt that to my uh organization. Um, I'm an AO that actually uh does my own DRO. Uh, I have BCs, but you know, sometimes even when they do it, you know, I don't like the way it looks. So I, I change it up at night, you know, because like I said, you know, you gotta definitely you know, try to keep a hand on your organization to make sure uh, you're getting the kind of numbers you want. So I have about three years experience. Um, I've been to the uh, pretty much the last two uh, route consultant conventions that's that's been in Vegas. So I met, you know, a lot of people there and and touch base. I've had numerous amount of contractors and uh, actually potential uh, investors that hit hit me up. And, you know, I have actually came down and and, and shadow, you know, some of the drivers in my business uh, down here in uh in Florida. So like I said, I'm, I'm down in Fort Myers. So, you know, we kind of got missed by the, uh, the hurricane uh, this time, you know, it's kind of going a little West and further up towards like the Tallahassee area. But uh, you know, we were definitely in the destructive path of uh, hurricane Ian, which was right around this time last year uh, that it came pretty much, uh, you know, towards us down in Fort Myers. Yeah. Well, we're glad you're safe down there, Marlon. And again, we, we thank you for being here. We okay. love the wealth of knowledge you bring to us here. So let's kind of get into some of this content. So 
the last the last three peak seasons you've kind of seen and seen what that timeline that prep looks like leading up into it kind of just give us the overall view kind of break it down by month and so what you what are you thinking about in september october november what's kind of your mindset just maybe a brief 30 60 seconds on each one of those and what what are you preparing for what are you doing in each of those months leading up to december okay uh based on how you're obviously you're you're willing to run your business i mean if you're i mean i'll definitely say with most areas if you go into a point where um you know if you're wanting to help people and stuff like that during peak then you want to use this time to start recruit drivers i mean you you i mean with the market now that i'm seeing i'm i'm rather a pretty good recruiter um, but you know, I'm telling you, you know, putting these guys through from the different, you know, referral sources and, you know, indeed and things of that nature that, you know, you utilize, you know, the market is tough. I mean, you run them through there and, you know, you got to have certain records, you know, that, that, that FedEx requires you to have, uh, you know, no felonies, you know, good driver's license, stuff like that. And, and obviously, you know, my screen now, if I run 20 applicants through there, I might see five or six of them that, that are red where they're ineligible to hire and you just got to keep going on. And continue doing that. So one is start hiring now. I mean, you you can start hiring if you start getting enough people in there uh, with first advantage. I mean, it's kind of taking, you know, sometime a week to two weeks to get people through the system. So you need to start doing that now. And obviously, you know, one of the worries might be, you know, do I want to bring on all these drivers and get stuck with all this payroll? Well, sometimes you can bring them on and based on their needs, if they need to put in a two weeks notice or something, you can kind of baby them along and kind of tell them when to put in that notice, you know, get them through the system get them processed. And, you know, if you, you have them through there, try to bring them on, you know, in October, maybe early November, if you can, but you know, some guys they're, they're looking for work. They want to work now. I mean, you're going to have to, you know, kind of decide whether you want to go ahead and bring them on, maybe give them part-time work, maybe bring them on, get them trained and, you know, see if another contractor in your terminal can use some drivers right now. And obviously they belong to you. So you're going to take them back, but you can get them work into where you have those people. Um, also trucks, uh, as far as rental trucks, you know, you want to start reaching out to those agencies, um, you know, trying to get rental vehicles. You want to start coordinating that now. Uh, most of them, they're going to charge you a little bit more if you wait towards, you know, the October, November time frame, just because, you know, stuff on hand. Um, uh, a couple of places you can actually look that a lot of people don't think about uh, is your U-Haul locations uh, for contractors. Um, you have to actually go with the U-Haul sales rep. Uh, they have a corporate uh, entity that you can utilize. And basically it's very easy. Once you get set up in there, you locate, put your insurance with them. Uh, you, you notify the rep, they give you an online thing to where basically almost instantly I can go on there and click four vehicles, uh, right now and select for pickup tomorrow. And, you know, they have them on there, you know? So like I said, I haven't even seen some of the other competitors like UPS using, you know, U-Haul and Penske, but you know, a lot of those U-Haul Penske enterprise, you know, start opening up those accounts uh, because they're, it's kind of hard to just go right in there and rent from them if you don't have a, a, a commercial account set up. So you want to start building those up with your your business, locking those in. Um, and and basically, like I said, just really, uh, you know, utilizing uh, the work area planner, which uh, I think you have a little bit of experience in that. Um, you know, look, looking at looking at your numbers. I mean, looking at what your last peak numbers were. I mean, if you're looking at that and seeing what your biggest day was, which for most of us, is usually that first Thursday in December, usually. I mean, if, if if it's showing you ran X amount of stops, I mean, you could probably plus it up, you know, maybe another four or 5% for this year, maybe. And, and long as you can see that you could probably hit those numbers, you're probably pretty good. I mean, so you're not overextending, but um, definitely down here in the area down here in Florida, I mean, I would say if you have enough drivers, there's going to be enough work to where um, I wouldn't necessarily say contingency, but you know, we we try to help out the other contractors in the building to where, you know, we, we're getting the peak surcharge and stuff like that. So, you know, obviously, you know, if you need a couple routes ran, you know, reach out to your other contractors. Uh, you know, sometimes FedEx is pretty uh reasonable with, you know, you setting up a plan. And and, and if that plan is working on subcontracting some of your area prior to that, then you can do that. And that that saves you the heartache down the road, especially if you have this area that you just don't want to service and you just you know, it's hard for you and you got another contractor who has people. You can say, hey, I'll cut this off to you till December 31st and you guys go ahead and run with it. So uh, that's a couple of things I utilize for, you know, kind of getting started with the peak stuff. Yeah. And a question, you, you kind of mentioned the heaviest day, Marlon, and that's that's my experience as well. It's usually that week, the big what I call the tidal wave that kind of crashes in right after Black Friday. It's usually whatever your typical heaviest day of the week is through the year. 
that day of the week after Black Friday will probably be your heaviest day of the week, just to kind of get all the, once all the orders get get filled and, and sent through, typically it's towards the end of the week, like you're saying. So what typically what we would do at, at Patent Logistics, Marlon, was we would look at that peak of peak day, that, that tip top of, hey, it's going to be the heaviest on this day. And we would recruit, but we wouldn't recruit the total number of drivers that, that were going to work that day, right? We would basically, on that day, we would plan on basically all the people that we had, you know, if maybe with the, you know, Spencer was not necessarily coming to run a route later on, but early on he would, if it's a really heavy day, myself as director of operations, if you have extra management that can come in and drive, we would put those people on the very heaviest days. But if you staff up to those super, super tip top of peak days, and you expect to run that same number of drivers every day, I think that's a recipe for failure. Do you want to maybe talk about like how many days out of peak season are you expecting to run your absolute maximum number of drivers? Um, usually during peak, I'd like to say every market is is totally different. I mean, like, you know, you know, especially down here, you know, from experience, like I was stating from from last year, we had a hurricane come through. Uh, so obviously everybody was ordering uh, furniture and beds and mattresses and all that stuff. So, you know, when, when I talked to a couple of contractors up in the Tampa area, you know, they were kind of dead. You know, their their peak was terrible. But down here, I'm like, hey, come down here. There's plenty of work. I mean, our terminal was backed up about 50,000 packages a day and wow. they couldn't get caught up. So, you know, each area is different. But I would probably say you could probably expect to hit that maximum maybe two or three times. I mean, definitely uh, as it gets closer, as it gets too close to Christmas, I mean, like the 24th, that's your downturn. That's your downturn on that. Right. I mean, basically, if, if you have temporary drivers and stuff like that, you have rental vehicles, like on the 24th, you want to get that stuff back because come the 25th, 26th, well, they don't operate on the 25th, but at least the 26th, it, it's a complete 360 from the last week. So you're just burning through money if you have all those people on there. And, and usually it's hard to give them away because everybody else is running through the same problem, uh, you know, with the drop in volume and stuff. So I would probably expect to, you know, hit those maximum numbers, maybe two or three days. But, you know, obviously you still want to have enough in the pool to kind of, you know, cover, you know, you know, drivers will come in there and say they can run, run this and that. But, you know, we all know drivers hit burnout. I mean, and that's what you got to watch it. I mean, you know, you might give them extra, you know, incentives, uh, bonuses and stuff like that. But, you know, you got to know your team. I mean, they'll say, hey, give me 300 stops. Well, you can probably do that one or two days. But, you know, to do that four or five weeks, I mean, you're you're asking for either all of a sudden they say, I can't do this anymore. And they want to take a day off. And now you're you're kind of you know screwed in that aspect. So yeah. uh, that's kind of what you want to look at. But yeah, I would say try to maximize hitting maybe three or four days of that. But, you know, peaks, you know, five, five weeks or so. But, you know, definitely like Black Friday, you normally in my experience, you don't have to stress too much about that day. I mean, run that as a normal day. Usually, um, you know, Mondays usually start picking up a little bit, but that's usually the first day of cyber monday so by the time that stuff gets in the network it's usually that wednesday thursday friday that starts picking up but usually your first couple of days right after the holidays don't try to throw everybody in there usually right after thanksgiving i mean if you want them to have the you know enjoy their holiday a little bit you know kind of kind of manage them a little bit because saturday is generally not going to be too too heavy um you know sundays are usually not that heavy anyway during peak and then that Monday, just start preparing for that Cyber Monday and, you know, kind of looking at your resources on that. It, now, Marlon, when you go into peak season, do you kind of try to, you know, a certain maybe percentage of, of your annual revenue or, or maybe you calculate it differently, but are you going into peak season with a war chest or a certain amount of extra cash on hand that you're like, I know I'm going to need this amount for, for basically onboarding costs for these new drivers, for getting trucks reserved? Are you going in with extra money or what's, what's kind of your cash flow situation look like as you're leading up to peak? Uh, really leading up to peak, you know, I utilize, you know, FedEx, uh, you know, for everybody that's new in here, FedEx offers what's called Schedule K. And that that Schedule K stuff starts, um, I think it starts around the week of the, the 16th of September this year. So you get 10 weeks of that. Uh, and that's the buildup money to go into peak. If you sign Schedule K, basically what they have this year, uh, they're using the same method last year, basically your 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 daily stop threshold is pretty much going to be the same that's listed as your daily stop threshold that you have, you know, even now. So if you don't know that, you can look on your DSW, you can look on your settlement statement. It tells you what your daily stop threshold is. So that's what that's the number you're going to have to meet based off of there. But then you you, you hey Marlon, can you break that break that down? Tell people if they don't know what exactly is that daily stop threshold. Okay, so the daily stop threshold once you 
you you have an obligation based on your contract. You know, I'm just going to use a number, say 2100. Uh, if my daily stop threshold is 2100 and I'm running 1400, 1500 a day, and it's in my area, I'm fine. I can I can continue to run that. If my area goes up to say 2200 and my daily stop pro is 21, if I can run it, you always have the choice. You can go ahead and run it. But if you're just stressed out with resources and you can't go over that contracted amount of 2100, then you have the right to decline anything over that. Um, and that also, when you sign Schedule K, you look at, you know, FedEx is using stuff like, uh, you know, concurrent, uh, the concurrent areas and also uh, reasonable proximity. And what that kind of means when you sign Schedule K, you have to also take into consideration if you're stacking up to where you feel like, oh, well, I won't hit 2100. I'm I'm at 1500. Well, you got to be careful. That guy to the left or right of you, he might not be playing that so well. And what happens when he fails, it gives FedEx the right to insure. And what they can do, they can move his stops over to you, even though you don't want it. Contractually, they can move those stops over to you and take you up to that threshold. So now you're 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 breathing breathing through peak, no problem, fifteen hundred. And then all of a sudden, guy to the left, guy to the right starts failing, and then they they give you a little notice, a couple of days, and they say, hey, you know, Bob over here, you know, he, you know, we we got to move an area now. Usually, they'll try to work with you if you jump on quick and don't give them a lot of feedback on it. They'll give you a nice, sweet area on it, you know, some dense stops. You know, they're not going to send you too far out. So you can get two, three, maybe even 400 residential. But if you don't really plan for that and you sign that Schedule K, uh, they can move those stops up to you and they can move them over to you. And now you'll eat that, you know, you'll get those uh, those DNAs, you know, those failures because you didn't you didn't meet that that criteria under Schedule K. And when we talk about the Schedule K, you know, you have that. Schedule K beef up money, which starts, like I was saying, you get 10 weeks of it and it's based on your CSA. So um, when you look at cash on hand, like you were saying, I come in with the same thing I run with. I mean, I don't really expect to beef it up no more. I usually use, you know, my Schedule K offering, uh, which we're going to use just some random numbers. You know, it can be $2,700 a week. And when you say $2,700 a week for 10 weeks, that's a lot of money. And when you think about it, unless you're using that all for, you know, you know, payroll and all for recruiting or, or not recruiting, but trucks, you usually have a little money left over there. And that's that beef up money. Now, once peak starts, you know, the peak service weeks, that's usually that first week right before Thanksgiving, that Saturday to Friday with Friday being Black, Black Friday, that's your peak service. And that's where on your Schedule K offering, you'll have a weekly service number, which would show, say, 5,000. Any stops now within that seven day period, you service over that 5,000 mark, they'll pay you whatever's on your contract. So if it says you get $1.50 for every stop over your surge, uh, your surge stop, now this is different than the daily stop threshold, every stop over your surge stop will pay you $1.25. Well, if you service 10,000 stops and yours is only set at five, that means, you know, do the math, five times, 5,000 times $1.25 you're going to get that for one week. And that covers if you're running other, other people's area, um, if they offer any type of contingency, which I've seen them do. Actually, last year was the first time that I really seen them push it in the terminal because I think FedEx is kind of going away from, you know, just really trying to offer that far away contingency in the DCA if they don't have to. Um, so basically, even in the, our terminal, they were offering a dollar a stop for anybody that serviced any stops outside of their contract at CSA. And that's not the, that wasn't like the right to insure stuff. That was just like, hey, we'll do that. But they they made clear, you know, when we uh, had some of our meetings this year, um, that they're really focusing on that uh, liquefied damages this year, which basically is in your contract, which I think it's on everybody's. I think it's like $3 a stop. So you have to be careful if you sign Schedule K and they pay you that money and all of a sudden you fail during that time and you fail to service that, if they have to pay somebody else, even it might be a dollar a stop, they can come back to you up to three dollars a stop and charge you back that and you'll have to pay that. So, you know, you got to kind of analyze that, you know, Schedule K is something that, you know, it's each contractor's ability. I mean, FedEx will kind of give you some crap on it if, you know, station management, if you decline it. But, you know, you kind of got to know where you're at. And if you know that, hey, I'm not trying to be stressed out this peak and run all this stuff. I'm just not going to sign Schedule K, which means you don't get the peak beef up money. You don't get the weekly surge stuff. You just continue running as normal and you do what you need to do. Now, obviously, 
you're still obligated to go up to that daily stock threshold, which again, you know, you're going to have to service it anyway. The only difference is if you don't sign Schedule K, they can really only just give you stuff that's like right next to you. They can't use that method that you have to drive through an area and have you, you know, 20 miles away or something like that. So that's something to look at when you uh, you you do your Schedule K and you review it. Each business is different. So you kind of got to look at that. Yeah, it's high, it's high risk, high reward. And you got to judge that like you're saying, Marlon. I mean, if there's a lot of contingency opportunities in your terminal and you want to staff up like crazy, and go, just go nuts. That would be a great opportunity to sign Schedule K. If you think you can get those people in and just gobble up the stops, might be a good idea. If you think everybody's good to go and you want to calm, a relatively calm peak season, right? There is no such thing really. But if you want a calmer peak season, maybe you just say, you know what? I'm just going to run it and I'm going to run it to my threshold and that's all I want. Then that might be something you where you would want to decline Schedule K. Uh, let, let's move over and talk now, Marlon, a, a little bit about safety. So obviously you got more drivers on the road. You got a more of a risk profile out there on the on the roads, right? So what are some things that you've done in your organization to promote safety for your drivers that are coming in? Temp drivers, like, hey, this this is just a peak gig for me. I'm gonna go back to my normal job. I don't have a ton invested in this. How do you incentivize and promote safety for your peak drivers? Uh, well, for peak, honestly, I've had pretty good. Uh, you know, uh, luck with just pushing the same thing I push, you know, year round. I mean, obviously I'm uh, one of the certified trainers uh, in my organization, along with two of my BCs. Uh, you wanna, so hey, can you explain, explain what that means real quick for those who may not? Okay, so uh, there, there's a few vendors that you can utilize that FedEx requires to uh, onboard drivers that are driving, uh, you know, your over 10,000 pound vehicles uh, and anything that's on your schedule B contracted vehicles. Um, you have to utilize uh, some of the vendors. I know ground clouds, one of them, I think uh, there's a couple other ones, but I've been through ground cloud. So obviously it's a, it's a, it's a training that you go through that it's valid for two years. Um, it goes over all the training that's required, the stuff that you kind of need to, you know, beat into the drivers as what they need to do as far as some of the big stuff, you know, some people don't think about, and I'll kind of give you guys a little free hint. You know, obviously when you park your vehicle, you want to instill in your drivers. And when they park that vehicle, they want to position that vehicle so they can drive straight when they leave. You don't want them having to back out because stuff crawls in behind them and they hop in and go to reverse and bam, they hit a car. So, you know, you want to you want to always instill that into them. You hit them at the safety meeting. Hey, when you when you position your vehicle, always position it to leave and also always watch for, you know, overhangs. You know, if you don't think you can fit through it, don't go in and stay out of drive throughs. I mean, I haven't had any drive through accidents, but believe you me there's somebody every year that takes out a McDonald's thing. And it's like, why were you in the freaking, why were you in the drive-thru? Like, there's no reason to be in the drive-thru. So, I mean, some of that stuff is just constantly reiterating that, um, you know, through group messages, you can do it on the scanner. I mean, just constantly beating some of this stuff in because believe it or not, sometimes, you know, they forget about some of this stuff. And as long as you're telling them every day, hey, make sure you're doing this, make sure, you know, you're, you're wearing your seatbelt, you know, just constantly check some of your, uh, you know, your video stuff, your veteran and stuff like that to make sure that some of these drivers are, are doing the stuff safely. And if they're not, you know, like I said, you know, praise them when they do it right, but also, you know, make sure you're able to, you know, conduct some type of training or up to, you know, termination if they're not doing that, because like we hold a lot of liability with the, uh, the schedule L and, and the other stuff that's, you know, placed down on us. And, you know, it's your business. I mean, something as simple as a, a driver causing, you know, multiple accidents, you know, that can really affect you. So you kind of have to really uh, nail down on there. Uh, when we talk about onboarding drivers, um, another thing that, you know, kind of for, you know, pe many people might not have looked at for uh, peak season, and this is my first year doing it, but I've seen tremendous success. And that's with uh, the AVP drivers. Um, AVP is the alternative vehicle program. And that's where you can onboard um, you know, a regular driver, as long as they're 21 years or older, uh, in a vehicle under 10,000 pounds, uh, you got to pay them hourly, but basically you can set up the smalls to where they can take it. And that's, that could be a, a great thing with this express integration coming in, because now you don't have to have one of your, you know, schedule B drivers coming in, doing this stuff at six, you can get a, maybe a retiree who's up at five 30 in the morning and you can have them wait for all your eight 30 commits and 12 30 and all that stuff. And, he can take that stuff out and the onboarding process. Um, I, I would just urge anyone that wants to look at it, just try it with one or two people. Try it with one person. I mean, literally, the onboarding time for that, you can go in there today. Uh, say we're using the time of like 5 p.m. You can send out a, 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 a alternative vehicle link to uh 
to a prospective driver, they can go in there, fill that out, send it back to you. You approve it in first advantage. Normally within 24 hours, that driver's approved. He's approved to drive. And basically the longest part is getting their vehicle approved, which I would say if you're doing that and you know this guy's going to do it, simultaneously, you got to send pictures. There's a new portal and it's like a uh, uh, where well, you got to enter your re a rental vehicle. So if you guys haven't taken a look at that, make sure you go on my ground Biz account. It's a link that they're now using for, uh, I think, actually one September is going to be the first bring on date for that for a rental vehicle. So, you know, rental vehicles are a little faster. AVP, believe it or not, it actually takes them two or three days to do that because they approve it at the station level. And for some reason, the alternative vehicles, they got to go up to Pittsburgh for them to get approved. And it's been pretty quick. I mean, I, I, I got three approved today. But like I said, I, I I bombarded the station with every chance I get. I'll put as many vehicles. They're like, who's all these vehicles? And I just put them in there and I get them ready. And like I said, you get those people with minivans. You get them with, you know, uh, other type of vehicles. You literally, you build a smalls route. You can literally put 150 small stops in a minivan. And some of these guys, believe it or not, they're, they're former FedEx drivers maybe a couple of years ago. So they know how to work the scanner, but they got a minivan. Now there's certain vehicles you have to look in there that does not qualify that. And that's cargo vans. Um, you know, you can't use cargo vans. It's got to have a van with at least a seat in the back. So it's got to be a passenger vehicle. And that's when you take those pictures, the VIN plate, FedEx looks at that and make sure, you know, you're not putting somebody in a cargo van because they, they won't let you do that. It's got to be a passenger vehicle, but it can be a, the biggest passenger vehicle you put in there. I mean, as long as it has passenger seats, you can run it under AVP. And like I said, it, it offers a lot of flexibility that, I didn't think about last year. And like I said, it allowed to have somebody come in at 4 p.m. and pick up some stops during peak and go out and deliver them in neighborhoods, which those stops, these guys want to work 40 hours. And believe it or not, under the AVP, under 10,000 pounds, uh, based on the, the DOT stuff, they're, they're not, they don't fall within DOT and they can work every day if they want to. I mean, as long as you pay them, they can work 30 days a month, 31 days a month if they want to. So that's some stuff that you can utilize that, I hadn't used during peak, but I have been starting. And I would definitely say, uh, you know, those contractors looking at it that are current, just, just maybe try to onboard one and just kind of see how it works. I mean, see how it works, see how it adds to your uh, thing. I mean, uh, you know, pay is different in every location. Um, you know, one thing I kind of looked at with pay is, you know, you pay them by the hour, but they cover the fuel, you know? So, you know, even if you paid somebody $30 an hour, you know, and, and a block of four, you give them enough packages, you know, they're covering the fuel. If they own their own vehicle, you know, they're covering the, the payment, they're covering the insurance. So you may be paying 30 bucks an hour to do, you know, 100, and, 100 stops and they can finish it. Well, you know, what I've seen, you actually make a substantial profit on there because there's zero maintenance with any of that. They cover all that stuff. So yeah, you got you got to think in terms of like, that's your, your, your basically your all in cost, right? Because instead of 20, 20 or 25 bucks an hour for a driver, plus your repair and maintenance, plus your fuel, that $30 an hour is all inclusive for those AV, AVP drivers. So yeah, I, I agree, Marlon. I mean, we're seeing a lot of contractors that are starting AVP and before, and as you know, I mean, Rock Consultant used to be like, you know, because they're L10 drivers, uh, we don't recommend paying hourly just because it's a little bit harder to uh, to account for from a, a, an auditing perspective. But if you can do it, it's absolutely the way to go. So uh, we're going to move into another section. I just want to read some stats real quick and get your take real quick on this, Marlon. So, um, you know, as, as most of you all may know, you know, the UPS strike, uh, was averted, thankfully, and if just thankfully for our supply chain, right? And and we saw the agreement that was reached by the Teamsters and UPS. And some of you may be wondering, well, what's that mean uh, for for you for FedEx drivers? And are they trying to migrate over to UPS? What's it look like now in the hiring situation? What's the you know the relative competition from UPS attracting drivers versus FedEx? So let me read you some stats here that we've noticed uh, from our our work we've done with Indeed. Uh, let me just read you some of these real quick. So there's been more than a hundred percent increase in FedEx drivers updating their resumes on Indeed. And again, I'm saying this because as you look at hiring more drivers for peak season, this is something that's going to potentially bear on your business, right? So a hundred percent increase in FedEx drivers updated their resumes compared to what had updated the resumes on Indeed before the agreement was signed with UPS and the Teamsters. Drivers started 27% more applications with other companies in June and July of this year compared to May. Job seekers are 28% more likely to start an application if the company offers benefits versus those that don't. Now, 
again, that's going to be very market specific. That's that's all of Indeed nationwide, right? But I'm just curious, Marlon, have you seen any impact to your recruiting, your hiring on the heels of this UPS and Teamsters agreement? Uh, me personally, I, I haven't. I mean, basically, you know, the market's kind of dry. I mean, honestly, I mean, like I said, you know, the recruiting this year is totally different than what it was last year. I mean, I'm pretty sure um, UPS probably has. I mean, I've, I've talked to, you know, a driver just in passing here locally uh, with UPS and, you know, basically it, it's pretty hard to get on with UPS. I mean, a lot of times, you know, maybe during their peak time, they'll bring on those peak drivers, but just like anything, they usually let them go because they're temporary. But to get on as full time and reach those maximum benefits, usually there's a process, you know, you got to get on there and kind of be a package handler. You kind of got to be a driver's helper. And then you get on there and, you know, by your third, fourth year, sometimes you're a driver. So, you know, I haven't, like I said, I haven't lost a single driver to UPS, me personally. And honestly, I don't think any contractors I know in my building, I don't think has, has seen any drivers putting in their resignation to, to go there. I mean, I know they, they talk a lot about the benefits. I mean, cause yeah, the, the benefits are quite impressive. And, and, and I know, uh, you know, FedEx kind of touched on that a little bit at the summit for, you know, some of those that went, you know, to the thing in Orlando, but, you know, based from their words, I mean, it's going to take a little time to catch up with that. And I think over time, they're going to have to meet the demands of that because it's just going to be, you know, our, our contracts usually aren't based too much off of, um, you know, the, the market, as far as the inflation, and inflation is going through the roof the last couple of years, you know? So, I mean, you know, they'll have to catch up. I mean, just like in certain markets of San Francisco, you know, I'm pretty sure contractors get paid a little more in San Francisco than they do in Mississippi. Why? Because if they didn't structure that, you wouldn't have no drivers. I mean, you, you couldn't pay a driver 20 bucks an hour in San Francisco. I mean, I don't even think they'll be able to be homeless. I mean, a homeless person probably makes more than that. So, I mean, you you definitely got to kind of find out what you want to do. But like I said, definitely, I haven't seen any uh, any big difference in that UPS. I mean, I was actually, you know, if anybody has time to go on there and look up some of their stats on uh, the, the driver stuff, it's pretty impressive at that that rate. I mean, it's definitely a deal that uh, I think it was very good, you know, but um, I haven't seen any big issues with uh, any of my drivers as far as uh, going over to UPS. I mean, they talk about it. And like I tell you, I'm, I'm a person that, you know, I don't try to stop any driver from leaving. If they want to go to greener pastures, I mean, I did the same thing in law enforcement. You know, hey, one, one police department was crappy. Another one had better benefits. You didn't have to shave. You got a take home car. You know, I go to that. You know, what are you offering me? And, and that's kind of what I looked at. So, I mean, I don't hold any feelings. They put in their two weeks and they go what they got to do. So, I mean, that's kind of how I run my business. So, yeah, and I think that's good. That's encouraging for I think people getting into this space and, you know, hey, I'm going to, am I going to have an impossible time getting drivers? That's, that's really good to know that it's just, it's not chaos out there uh, in terms of recruiting and, and keeping your drivers. So, uh, Marlon, I'm going to hit some events in our inventory and then we'll get into our open QA. So, again, you guys are, have just joined us since I opened here. Uh, go ahead and put your questions in the QA feature at the bottom. We're taking questions on not just what we talked about today, but anything FedEx ground related. So before we get to that, let me go ahead and hit our events and our inventory that we've got on our website. So the events we've got coming up, we've got the Dallas Roadshow. It's going to be, again, if you didn't get enough peak prep on today's webinar, that's okay. Come see us in Dallas. That's what we're going to be talking about, discussing, getting into even more in-depth info on that in Dallas. That's September 14th. So come see us there for the Dallas Roadshow. We've got a new investor summit that is here at uh, in, at our home office in Nashville, September 25th and 26th. If you're a new investor looking to get into the space, this is a really good opportunity to do that. We've got a Phoenix happy hour. So if you just want to get together, network, find out more from current contractors, your new investor or a current contractor, just come see us in Phoenix. That's going to be October 18th. Uh, if you want to sign up early for our next year's expo, we're not going to be in Vegas next year. We're moving to Dallas, Texas next June. Uh, or I'm sorry, I, I may not have the date right on that, but I think uh, John will have uh, some info on that in, in the chat. But if you want to go ahead and sign up, you can at routeconsult.com and you can find uh, links to book your spot there and get hotels reserved. So go ahead and do that now if that's something you're interested in. So let's go ahead and read the inventory that we've got new on the website this week. We've got eight, so bear with me. Uh, we've got eight new ones, and they are all P and D. So the first one, we're starting out west. We've got a Western Idaho listing, thirteen routes for nine hundred thousand dollars. This one has a sixty-two percent 
uh, of revenue. It's 16% EBITDA margin. It's got a, a manager with four years of experience, 16 trucks. That includes three spares. And it services rural routes, as you might expect, in Idaho. So if you're looking for something rural out west, that might be for you. Uh, the next one, we're going all the way to the other side. We're looking at East Central Rhode Island. Uh, this is eight P&D routes listed at $1 million even. This is a 19% EBITDA margin, highly profitable. One manager, one lead driver, 12 trucks, four spares. Uh, you got a lot of good uh, good margin there to, to operate that. It's a remote ownership opportunity and may be eligible for SBA financing if that's something you want. Moving over to Northern New York, we have a 7 p and route operation for 775000 This one's operating at a 21% margin, 11 trucks, four spares. This one is a profitable operation. Uh, if you're new to the space, this is a good opportunity for you on, on this one. It has an improved uh, newer model year fleet, and it operates under a six-day work week. Next one is another Northern New York listing for $775,000 five p and routes. This one is also at 21% EBITDA margin. This one has 10 trucks, five spares, so a really good fleet there. Rural routes on this one operates under a six-day work week. Moving down to Western North Carolina, we've got a 15 p and route operation for 1.59 million. This one's running at a healthy 22% EBITDA margin. This is a rural operation. It's got one manager with two years of experience, 15 trucks, the fleet is comprised of both leased and owned vehicles. Assumable truck debt is an option on this one. Next is Southwest Virginia, seven P&D routes for 750,000. 20% EBITDA here, one manager who can drive as needed, 12 trucks, so that includes five spares. Routes driven are easy to navigate. And if you're not familiar with DRO, this one is a pretty easy operation to navigate in terms of the tech side, the DRO, the route planning side, if you're looking for ease of operation as far as that goes. And last two, we got a Northwestern Florida, 27 P&D routes for four and a half million. This is at a very, very healthy 29% EBITDA margin. That's very good margins for P&D space. This has two managers and administrative employee on staff, comes with 36 trucks, Nine of those, of course, being spares. Backup drivers are available. And this one also may be eligible for SBA financing. Final one is going to be Western Florida. Seven routes for $1 million, 26% margin. This one comes with two managers with a combined experience of five years, 10 trucks, including three spares. These routes are dense urban routes. So if you're wanting to stay out of the country, these are going to be maybe more uh, more suitable for you. And this one also is eligible, may be eligible for SBA financing. So again, no line haul listings today. It's all P&D. So with that, uh, Marlon, they're, they're blowing us out, my friend. They gave us 16 questions here. So let's yeah, just wrap let's, let's do as many as we can here. All right. And some of them I can answer if you want. I mean, some of them are... Uh, yeah, let me let me read through here. Some of them uh, I'll I'll pass over to you. Um, okay. If you if you have one that you know you want to answer, just let me know. I'm just going to go through here in the order that I see them. Uh, Brian Stutson asks, "What is the average sale price versus NOI?" Example: three x earnings. Yeah, that's a good question, Brian. The typical multiple we're seeing in the space right now is right around that four x multiple. So now, needless to say, if you're bringing in a, a poor uh, NOI, or you're looking in business with poor NOI, the demand for that type of route is, is maybe going to be a little bit less. So you might see a lower multiple, but the ones that are bringing in those really healthy EBITDA margins, like I was saying, those might see a higher multiple. So anywhere around 4X is about what we're expecting to see in the space. Uh, anonymous, and this one might be one for you here, Marlon. I think he's talking about, he or she is talking about what's the process for peak hiring, how can you prepare for FedEx interviewing drivers on their background slash work history? Can they interview without the contractor? Am I liable for, let's, let's take this last one. Am I liable for another contractor's error processing a, if processing a driver, if I now hired the driver, you want to take that yeah. one? Yeah. What, what happens with it? You process the driver. So FedEx utilizes a third party uh, processing company called first advantage. Uh, the driver puts in the information based off the link you sent them. Um, it has to be filled out correct because now based during COVID, they had a, a kind of a waiver with, you know, First Advantage wasn't looking at their work history, didn't see if they met that one year uh, commercial driving experience. Uh, so now they're actually doing it. So you need to, when you talk to the person, you need to make sure they fill it out. And if they list a job, they need to make sure they have a, a valid uh, contact information because what happens, 
first advantage to try two or three times to get in contact with them. If nobody answers, they'll flag them as, you know, ineligible. Now, they can call First Advantage and update their information, and First Advantage would then be able to reach out to them and go from there. But um, no, you process the thing. If if I'm processing the driver and Jesse turns around and processes that, that same driver, um, it just all is going to depend on who gets them done first and, you know, where the driver, I mean, the driver's going to have to make that decision because, you know, if he runs the background on him first, it's going to cancel my background and I'll see that in First Advantage. So first thing I'll ask the guys, hey, are you applying for somebody else? Yes or no? I mean, yes. Well, you need to pick which one you're going to apply for, because obviously I'm not going to keep going through this if you're applying for somebody and I just leave it up to them. So, no, you're not responsible for somebody else's error. You can review their application before you approve it. And you need to make sure they answer those questions to fill them through the process a lot faster. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, Jonathan Quick asks, and I'll, I'll take this from Marlon. Peak season help that comes in is hired with understanding it is temporary. Are you guaranteeing a certain number of hours? Sounds like they most likely will be gone post 20, uh, post 1226. Yeah, Jonathan, that's mostly correct. Uh, we don't give any kind of guarantees. Now, what I like to do is I will, I will, I'll tell my new drivers coming in and I'll make it very clear to my team, my current team. I'll say, look, uh, the competition's on you guys. If I see a peak driver that comes in, right, and someone else is kind of slacking off, I'm not just going to fire you for, for being a little bit lazy, but if I've got a really poor performer, someone with a poor safety record, they're just not getting it done. My, my guys know that peak season is where the, the chaff gets sorted from the wheat, right? And so if someone comes in, they're a high performer, even though if with the understanding they're a peak driver, uh, if they have the potential to work longer than that and they want to go full-time after peak, I'm going to find a place for them on my team or that, or I'm going to see if I can find a place for them on someone else's team. If I have friends that are other contractors, Marlon, is that, is that something that you have implemented or what, what kind of mindset do you, do you give these new drivers coming in? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I hire everybody in, like I said, I bring them in during peak season. Uh, every year I've, I've kept some, some peak temporary drivers and, you know, they've not say fulfilled the spot, but I've kept them on sometime ate up the payroll because they they have good work ethic. And like I said, I don't know if that's my military background, but, you know, somebody that shows up to work every day, 730 in the morning, they don't call out, you know, you know, I don't care. I'm going to spend that extra money. I'm going to keep you working. I mean, there, there's no reason to let a driver like that go, uh, because like I said, he's showing up every single day. And I have, you know, I, I, I could say knock on wood, I have no stress on all my guys. I mean, you know, I've, I've hired some that didn't show up. Well, they're not with me anymore, you know, because I've gotten rid of them, you know, or I pass them to another contractor and said they don't show up, but they hired them because they needed people. But, you know, I kind of keep that same tech and that's why I constantly, you know, hire. But yes, uh, you know, I'll bring everybody in. But, you know, that 26, you definitely can't keep and go go further, you know, with your peak, you know, amount of drivers because you just won't have the volume to run that. Yeah, next one's from Anonymous. And this one's kind of a big one here. So I'm going to refer you, Anonymous, over to our past webinars that we've done. So what exactly is the Express integration going to look like? What should we expect with line haul integration with Express? Uh, the line haul piece is a little bit unclear at the moment. We have heard that FedEx Freight is going to absorb some of the Express line haul. Uh, beyond that, we don't really know a whole lot. But in terms of what the overall integration is going to look like on the P&D side, I would just point you to our YouTube channel um, our route consultant YouTube channel, go back and watch the webinars we've done some of the content we've uploaded on our route consultant uh, page under events and, and other content you can find. If you search for there, you have to put in your email and, and you can get access to our expo content that we did on express integration. Uh, we've, we've contacted a lot of different contractors that have already integrated and kind of gotten their best practices and what to expect. So go to our website, maybe John, if you could maybe pop that up here in the chat for us. Uh, where they can go to uh, to look and see on our website. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Uh, next one here, Marlon. Uh, love the videos with Marlon. Is there a way to get in touch with Marlon? So Marlon, do you feel comfortable sharing any contact info? Yeah, I mean, like I said, uh, my, my email address, if you guys look forward to, you know, either getting with me or getting with Ralph Consult uh, is mcampbell82 at gmail.com. So that's mcampbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L-82 at gmail.com. If you guys got questions, shoot me an email. If anybody wants to come down, take a look at the operation that I'm you know, running down here in Florida, I'm welcome to have you. Just let me know uh, and we can go from there. Love it. Love it. All right. Mike Kuser says, I'm looking at routes right now, but they are only paying the drivers $16 per hour. I would think that would make it hard to retain good drivers considering McDonald's pays $14 per hour. What is the going rate for drivers? I'm in the Northeast. Marlon, you kind of answered that if you want to recap that real quick. It's really going to vary by market. 
Yeah, it's going to vary by market. And obviously, even McDonald's, I mean, there's a sign right outside our terminal. They're actually paying $18 an hour. So McDonald's is paying higher. I mean, you got to look. I'm in Southwest Florida right now where uh, a two-bedroom apartment is $2,100 a month. Two bedrooms. So, nice. I mean, the, the cost of living down here is astronomical. I mean, you know, there's apartments, three bedrooms are almost three grand a month. So you got to look at the area that you're in. Uh, but like I said, you kind of, you know, your statements will usually reflect that area. Like if you operate in probably Mississippi somewhere, you know, you're probably going to have those driver rates around the, the 18, you know, 750 a, a week or something like that, you know, it, it's pretty comparable. So it just based on really the area you're in. Yeah. Uh, Armand uh, or Armand Belasaroff, he asks how to become a FedEx route contractor. Armand, uh, if you're a potential investor, you can just uh, email us at info at routeconsultant.com. We'll get you connected with a consultant or a, or a broker for whatever you're looking for, and we'll get you uh, introduced to the space. We have a ton of materials, uh, FedEx 101. We have so much that we can introduce you to, but info at routeconsultant.com is going to be a, the best place to start there. Uh, one from here from David Branch, Marlon. What did Marlon do to prepare for the potential bad weather? like the exact landfall was unclear this week. So stuff like hurricanes, people in coastal areas, what are you doing to prepare for stuff like that? And, wh and what's your responsibilities in situations like that? Okay, yeah. So a lot of people might have, you know, what, what's your responsibilities as far as running? Uh, you know, FedEx pushes safety big. And, you know, obviously definitely in our terminal, uh, I know some terminals, they give you a lot of pushback on it, but, you know, it's your operation. I mean, if you decide based on a hurricane, based on, uh, information to where, you know, local officials have made your area a mandatory evacuation. I mean, if it's a mandatory evacuation, you need to tell your drivers they need to heat those warnings because nobody wants to be responsible for loss of life just for coming in to deliver a package. And, you know, if that's the evacuation, then you need to have those drivers evacuate. You need to let FedEx know that, hey, based on the weather coming in, I I'm not going to be running. Now, you do need to make sure you have a plan to get current because you're going to get bombarded with a lot of stuff. I mean, we we have another meeting tomorrow in reference to the weekend uh, stuff because volume came in extremely light today. I mean, we normally average 26,000 packages on a on a Wednesday in our terminal, and I think we got 17,000. So, I mean, the thing is, it's extremely light, but uh, based on the hurricane and, and other stuff that we usually run into, fuel, make sure that last day coming in, Make sure your drivers go fill up and make sure they top the vehicles off before they bring come to the terminal. Because even yesterday, we didn't get hit that bad down here in Fort Myers. But, you know, there was two, three hour long, you know, lines at the gas station uh, just for yesterday. When we had Hurricane Ian, oh, it took you eight hours sometime. I mean, FedEx actually pulled up and they actually brought in fuel trucks to our location. They brought in showers. They brought in bottled water. Uh, so if any drivers needed to get showers and stuff like that, they uh, they they had the full force down there. I mean, there was, you know, senior VPs that came down during Ian just because, you know, there was so much destruction based off of that. But, um, you know, overall, have a good phone tree, communicate with your team. And like I said, you know, you as a contractor, you decide if if it's worth coming in. And usually, uh, well, FedEx will bag. They have no choice. I mean, you just need to have a plan to recover from that afterwards. I mean, if you don't have a plan to recover. You, you might need to figure out what you need to do. You might need to call some, you know, call some contractors from another area to see if they can come down and help you out for a couple of weeks or something. But, uh, you know, you just need to reach out with people and, and, and work out, you know, that type of stuff. Yeah. Ami Behar asking y'all, there are so many questions. There's no way we're going to get to all these, but I'll, I'll do as many as I can here. Uh, Ami asks, will RC do any happy hours slash events in the Southern California area? Yes. So Ami, we actually did one in San Diego this past February and based on demand, we will absolutely do more out there as we're able to. So what I'd recommend is if you and other investors or contractors out there in your area know that you want to try to get us out there for an event, reach out to us. Again, hit us up at that info at routeconsultant.com. Reach out to us and let us know, hey, there's multiple of us out here that would love to have you come to whatever area we're in, and we will do our very best to get out there. Uh, Jeremy Davis says, uh, Marlon, this goes to your AVP question, the additional drivers with their own vehicles. They don't have to pass FedEx driver standards, something like Uber drivers. So uh, if you could recap real quick, what exactly do the AVP drivers have to do? Okay, AVP, like I said, they're they're your local retiree that, yeah, that's in the neighborhood. I mean, you know, you you just have to have a driver's license and be over 21 years of age. Uh, and well, have a, have a driver's license in good standing. And 
you know, have a, a, a background. All FedEx is going to, all first advantage is going to run is that background and that driver's history. They're not going to call any employers. They're not going to look under any work history. Uh, they're going to onboard them just like that. And basically, uh, like I said, it's up to you. You look through the resume, you talk to them, you kind of see what they're doing. I mean, some of them could be, you know, pizza delivery drivers. Uh, I've, I've, I've got two guys right now that actually used to be Amazon Flex, which is almost the same thing, but under Amazon. And basically, like I said, some of these guys can do a hundred and some stops a, a, a day. I mean, they're, they're, they're beast at some part. They just, you know, when, you know, when you bring them on and you want to move them to your regular schedule V program, you can do that. That is a process that you have to bring them through the certified program. But I would say if they got that mindset coming in, you probably want to bring them in that way first instead of sending them through AVP. But AVP is a direct way to where you can come in and recruit. And right now, by this time, have at least five to six drivers ready to go no later than Monday. I mean, literally, I mean, you could have them ready to go Monday. That's how fast that program works. And they can they can do the stuff. I mean, like I said, whether you want to base your operation off that or not, but I, I like I said, I would just urge anybody looking at it to try it, just one driver and build them a route and just see how it goes. Yeah. Uh, Tyler, you asked several questions here. I can't get to all of these, but I'll hit one of them uh, just because we covered it recently on a webinar. What does DCA mean? A DCA is a dedicated capacity agreement. That's sort of the old contingency contract. They've moved into what's now called a service capacity agreement. And if you want to know more about that, go uh, hit up our recent webinar that we did uh, a couple of weeks ago on that. That'll tell you everything you want to know and more about the contingency contracts and what these new SCA agreements look like. So I believe that was two weeks ago. Uh, John, if you could maybe pull that up and throw that in the chat for uh, for Tyler to go look at. Uh, Jim, Gills, Jim Gilson asks, what makes a package of routes open versus not open for SBA? Jim, that's a great question. I personally don't know, but that's another one I would ask info at Route Consultant. We have multiple people, our financial analysts, uh, Josh Gregory from our consulting team, it can absolutely answer questions like that in terms of what is SBA eligible and why. Uh, Jeremy Davis, how many routes can you own? Again, same thing, reach out to us here. That's a pretty complicated question. Generally, there's a minimum scale in each building that you go into. And what I mean by that is if you go into a building, you have to be at a certain percentage of the total building volume. So you can't go in there and just maybe have like 1% of the volume. You have to have maybe 5, 10, 20%, depending on how many contractors are in there. They want you to have a minimum amount of scale in terms of total volume that you have to be responsible for. So that really just depends on the market that you're in. There's some contractors out in very, very rural areas that own 100% of the terminal. And there's some in your gigantic terminals in very dense areas that might only own two, three, 4% of the terminal. So again, you just want to go in and on a terminal case by case basis and, and find that out. And I'll, I'll caveat on the, uh, the yeah. route you own because they FedEx actually, believe it or not, you know, it was right before, well, pretty much right as COVID was ending, you know, they wanted you to get small. They wanted you to be small. Now the kind of thing is they want you to be bigger now. So, you know, they put in some, uh, some stuff now to where if you're under a certain scale, you can't sell to an outside contractor. You would have to sell to somebody to the left or right of you based on your building. Also, they, they've changed their scale guidelines a little bit to where it's the amount of stops per week over a seven day period. So I just went, same stuff. I was looking to buy something in the terminal that's right next to me. You know, I went there probably six months ago. They said, no, you can't buy it. You're overscaled. Well, asked that same question pretty much uh, about a month ago. And they were like, oh, you're good. And I'm like, well, what's the scale? And they were like, well, our scale is now 15,000 stops a week. And I was like, a week? I was like, that's that's almost 2,800 a day. And they're like, yeah, as long as you're under 15,000. I was like, okay. So now... They're, they're more amped to letting contractors run almost 28 to 2,900. Now, when you do run over that 25, I think we might've looked at it, you know, maybe a couple of years ago, you know, you run into some different stuff that FedEx puts you on a little higher pedestal when you, you when you operate over like 2,500 stops, especially your, your, your inbound local service is what we have to abide by based on our contract being kind of like a 99.0. Uh, when you operate over that level, they can hit you at a 99.5. And it's just usually some contractors don't want to be under that one because you can mess around and lose your contract if you operate at a 99.3, which most would say, okay, out of the year, I operated at a 99.3, correct, but you were over scale or you were over that limit and now you can run the risk of you know losing your contract. So most just stay at that 99.0 and usually if you provide decent service for that, you have nothing to worry about with the 99.0. That is completely uh, doable. 
Uh, Jonathan Quick asks, for driver pay, is there collusion going on? Cannot imagine drivers won't skip to a different contractor if they are paying better. So, yeah, Marlon, ha ha describe kind of what that, that process looks like in the terminal. Generally, we have what's called a gentleman's agreement kind of between the different contractors. If everybody can kind of play nice in the same sandbox, we try not to poach drivers from each other. But what what have you seen happen? What What's your policy on, on sharing drivers and seeing drivers go between contractors? I mean, like I said, I mean, if, if they put in, and I've told all every contractor, I mean, if, if a driver puts in his two weeks, he can go wherever he wants. Uh, but a lot of the time is, you know, you got to understand these drivers feel if you were in their position. I mean, you know, if, if you have the ability in your business to pay a driver a good wage, then you have no worries. You know, there's no worries about it. I mean, I feel that, you know, for the last couple of years, I mean, I'm pretty sure I could have saved probably a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, but I contend that I pay my drivers very well. And like I said, if I've had some that thought about leaving, but the contractor wouldn't match their pay. So they're right where they're at. And, and that's a bargaining tool that you have. Uh, same thing with vacation also. You know, some drivers has been with you, you know, if they're with me over a year, I give them a I give them a week's vacation for every year. So if they I have three drivers has been with me for three years since I bought. Now those cats, you know, they ain't going nowhere because for them to go on with somebody else, that other contractor is not going to pay them three weeks of vacation. And that's one of those, you know, pretty much retainment tools that you can utilize. So I would say, you know, don't try to go on the low end and be the cheapest person in the terminal. I mean, in our terminal, there's really no agreement on how much you pay. Uh, but we we do, we, we, we don't have that much of uh, poaching going on, um, you know, honestly, because like I said, you have those that they pay what they pay. And some drivers know what they pay and they're not going to go to them anyway. But, you know, you'll have some that pay decent and they pay good. And like I said, as long as the driver shows up to work and does his job, he'll be awarded with a with a paycheck every week. And that's mostly the thing the drivers want, a steady paycheck every week. And that's what I want for them to do their job. If they do that, we have no problems. Last one here, Marlon. We are running out of time. Oh, my gosh. You guys absolutely overwhelmed us with questions. We love that. Come back next week and we'll definitely try to have Marlon on again at some point. So check your emails for that. We will get him on, on here again in the future. The last one here, Marlon, we'll close with this again. Another one from Jim Gilson. How many hours per week are you yourself putting in personally to oversee your routes? Um, I probably say I do about 24 usually. I mean, I, I don't do a lot. I mean, basically most of my time uh, is spent. I'm, I'm usually at one or two. I'm out of two terminals right now. I'm helping in one terminal and I'm out of another one. The good thing about Florida down here, I have three terminals within about 15 minutes of my house. So that's great. I mean, and I'm, I mean, that's the only place I'm in. So I don't have to go far. I know all the station managers and all three of the terminals and they can call me to help. So basically I can hit two terminals in the morning. I go to one terminal, they dispatch and usually depending on the bigger terminal, they're still holding out to 930. So I can drive over there before those guys leave. So I'm able to see, uh, you know, both teams, both management teams and everything like that. So most of my time is done at night, you know, basically because I do do the DRO. Um, I have my manager start it, and usually every night is they don't put some anchors on there that don't make sense. And I'm like, what is this? And I have to move it. But I stay up to usually 12, 12 o'clock. You know, our cut times on our DO, DRO is 1 a.m. So, I mean, usually I'm up to not, not all the time of one, but I'm up to at least 12, usually messing around with the DRO, you know, moving stuff around, trying to maximize stuff as much as I can. But I don't put in a ton of hours. I mean, now during peak time, I will get out there and drive. Like I said, I'm I'm probably good for about 120 stops, and then I'm I'm hurting. I'm hurting the next day. But I can do it. And I've been times where I've I've went in. You know, driver wants to complain about something. Hey, go home. And they look at you. No, go home. And I'll I'll run their route. And that's the kind of mentality. Definitely, I would I would advise anybody looking to come into this space is you know learn the business, learn learn the stuff yourself. You know, I've seen countless times to where. You know, not saying having a good VC is 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 everything, but you don't want to put all that into a VC with your business because what happens when that VC decides to either get mad at you or leave or anything like that, you're left high and dry. And and you're either, I mean, I've helped two or three contractors. I literally helped them with their DRO until they found somebody that that can get on there and help them. And that's just not a good space to be in. So definitely take the time to learn your business. And when you learn it, this is a very easy space to operate in. Uh, and like I said, it's not mailbox money. I mean, some people come in and there's some, once you start rolling, you, you can just sit at home and let your BCs do it. But I mean, you definitely want to have some type of, uh, you know, you know, reach in there to where, you know, people know, hey, you're the person in charge and you're, you're running this stuff. So yeah. 
I love it. Marlon, thank you so much for being here, my friend. We look forward to maybe seeing you in the future at some point soon. Uh, tons of questions. And again, sorry we didn't get to all of them today, but come back next week. Ask them again. We'll do as many as we can. We will see you guys next week. Marlon, stay safe down there, my friend. Thank you.